Thank you very much, <coughs> and thanks to uh, Richard for the introduction. Um, while uh, Gui sets up, I'll just say a little bit about the background of our initiative. Gui and I are uh, based at Aarhus University at uh, the Center for Urban Network Evolutions, which is like a little Danish Max Planck uh, institution, what we call a center of excellence. So it's good to know that you are a center of excellence. Uh, which was founded uh, a couple of years ago uh, with the intent to try and study uh, the, dyna the dynamics of urban uh, urbanizations in various parts of the world from the point of view of networks. So we've been studying urbanism in many other ways in our college, but we're trying to boost an understanding of the role of networks. If you want to read more about that, uh, we have uh, this book has just come out, which will uh, highlight some of the projects that we are dealing with. We have work groups working in several places in the world, e world East Africa, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, Northern Europe. We're obviously here in the capacity of the North European uh, section. We will later be presenting in the capacity of the East Mediterranean se uh, sector, uh, because the uh, group um, Rubina Raya and Achim Lichtenberg, who should have been presented for the last presentation. They were summoned for an ERC interview, and as you know, you don't turn those down. And um, But right now, uh, we'll be dealing with one of the sites that uh, Richard already introduced, uh, in the Reba, which is one of the early North Sea Emporia. We've just finished uh, a 14-month uh, excavation there to gather a new and better data set on that site. I'm not going to tell about that because we haven't had time to analyze the materials there so that what we'll present today is based on an earlier uh, series of excavations. If you want to know about the new project, you can buy this excellent magazine in uh, the stores and there's a big uh, teaser about the, uh, that project. But today um, we're talking uh, about um, work done on early excavations. So I couldn't resist. Uh, I think this is Copenhagen 10 years ago or something, where uh, Richard was also in conversation with Pu uh, Ren. Uh, uh, and the reason why I, I, I brought this in is that, that this has been a, a constant inspiration uh, from Pu Ren and Richard's work uh, for uh, what we're currently doing. Uh, I don't need to introduce the parentheses, luckily uh, Richard did that, uh, or the North Sea Emporia and their uh, rise. But our work is uh, founded on that those notions. We uh, we're concerned with finds from this place, Rebe, not the medieval town here, uh, which is uh, um, a fantastic place. I strongly recommend it. But what's really interesting about this is, is the little strip of land over here on the north side, uh, where the Vikings settled. Uh, 400 years before uh, the medieval town really got off. That site was found, uh, the North Sea Quora uh, site was found in the 1970s, and since then we have uh, struggled to get a, re uh, a, a strong data set uh, from uh, that uh, site. The initial excavations were placed in, sort of in, in peripheral parts of the settlement. Later in the 1980s and 90s, there were excavations that targeted the right places, understood the stratigraphy, but were confined to small scale rescue work. Uh, the best of those sites is the one that we're going to present work from today, the post office site excavated by our colleague Klaus Sodeil and his uh, uh, collaborator Steve Jensen. And as you can see from these counts, there's quite an abundant uh, number of uh, glass beads and tessera and pieces of workshop debris from working on glass, mainly glass piece production, but also a lot of shards, some of which are there probably as colored, some of them probably as broken vessel glass actually. What's also important about Reba is that we have an extremely fine-grained stratigraphy um, that allows us to separate periods very well uh, and to place them rather accurately. We're working on refining that, but for the time being, Gruy and I have been working on uh, two workshops from that stratigraphy. Uh, one which is among the very earliest finds in the early 700s, one which is uh, from about the 780s uh, with quite different uh, productions. And then we have added a little bit of work on 
a later context from the late 9th century, which uh, I and my <coughs> colleagues, uh, Sarah Kra and uh, Morten Sose from the museum, excavated two years ago, uh, a little bit, <coughs> a bit uh, uh, away from the center of the marketplace. If you look at uh, the finds here, uh, there are some uh, very clear trends in uh, uh, the use of finds phases. One phase after the other. Uh, this figure shows you the glass split, so it's excluding the tesseract, excluding the beads, but things that could be regarded <coughs> as workshop debris. And the colors here represent the colors of the glass. And what you can see is that there is, in the early phases, so in the uh, early mid 700s, a huge amount of blue glass and not very much else. Then, uh, in the uh, phase of our second workshop in the 780s, uh, there is a remarkable change which a lot more uh, green colored glass splits and some more yellow and then what should be you should also notice is that uh, around here when we get into the 790s and the uh, 800s the raw glass disappears and what really happens in this space is that um, uh, glass beads gets to be uh, uh, Imported as ready made from the Eastern Mediterranean and the uh, Islamic area. So, the mass production <coughs> essentially stopped there. So, most of the materials that we have concerned with the glass bead production is from the 8th century, and the 9th century is an entirely different kettle of fish, almost. So, I think this is where you are taking over. Do I? No, you're going to present that. Right, well, so what we've done, uh, what we're currently continuing during is try to uh, uh, understand, not just in general, but in the specific workshop content, what's coming in and what's going on. How can we, uh, what types of glass reach uh, and can we distinguish the raw materials and the production processes within the individual workshops? The basic question, or the basic, well, is lined up between these three glass types. There is Roman natural glass, which was recycled since the second third, uh, century. At some point in the 8th century or 9th century, we see Islamic plant axe glass as a new material coming in to the north. And also in the eight, in late 8th and 9th century, we have a production of uh, wood ash glass commencing in northern Europe in, as part of the Egyptian Renaissance. These are the three sort of major types of glass that we can follow and that the uh, group will, will, will present our results in. And then I think it's the, yeah, do you want to? I think since yeah. you excavated them, I think okay. maybe yeah. you, I mean, it would be better. So, <laughs> just very briefly, uh, this context uh, is the first of our focal points. From the new excavation project, we have about five of these very early uh, workshop uh, uh, scattered. This is nothing like San Vincenzo. This is a glass bead maker sitting down, almost like a Paleolithic flint tapping episode. What you find is two square meters, three square meters of glass debris around the central part where glass was melted and uh, turned into bees. But it is such a confined, contextually precise material to work with, and that's the beauty of it. The one we have here is dated to the seven tenths, roughly and contains uh, materials that we think are raw materials, including glass vessels, but also a, a lot of tesseract. And these lumps of glass, which are not tesseract, but something else, and we will tell you what that something else might be. And then it has got uh, beads, mainly uh, faulty beads, uh, that can, um, fragmented during cooling, uh, and also uh, pieces with top marks and Workshop Next uh, the, um, We can follow a series of workshops, but uh, to make a long story short, we have then focused on uh, one workshop from the late 8th century where we see this change into a much greater proportion of green glass and an entirely new uh, set of beads, what we call uh, wasp beads, I think, for obvious reasons. Um, 
So, uh, which is produced in a slightly different way, using slightly different colors and a, a, uh, conspicuous, uh, confined range of colors, which uh, raise the question whether the glass bead makers here were able to control the coloring. So, was there in fact more of a technical knowledge of the material in this workshop? So, these are the two uh, contexts that we'll be dealing with from the work from the um, from the. Uh, center of the Emporium area. The Emporium itself, uh, or the main uh, part of it, is a little complicated in the late ninth, mid to late ninth century. It's still a question when activity there ends. Uh, there's a lot of truncation. But we were lucky to find a few years ago when we actually laid out in the uh, early burial site a couple of some uh, buildings, one of which had a uh, uh, great material of beads and some working debris from the mid 9th century, and this is the last um, concept for building the okay. Good, so what we did is we put them in the lab, and we did uh, electro microscope for the major elements, and we did laser operation, and we did the trace elements, and this is our lab in Aarhus. Um, and then from the first context of the blue workshop, um, you can see this is a plot from uh, this particular one from Freestone, but originally from Freestone, from these guys, that they are all major glasses, and that goes for the tesla, goes for the vessel glasses, the splints, and beads, and so on. And from the next workshop, with the different kinds of beads and different colors, and also the blue splints over here, and some green raw material and yellow, maybe raw material. Um, again, they're all Roman, or they're all major glasses. So no new glass types seem to have arrived at this point. <laughs> the last, uh, the pit house, again we had uh, very different things. We had some natron glasses, so body here according to the magnesium potassium, but we also have some plant ash glass, and in both cases these are blue beads. And then we have wood ash glass, they're kind of off the charge uh, uh, for their uh, potassium, and they look like this, they were kind of this uh, called tree green. And this is actually blue, but completely uh, um, more on the outside. Good. If we look at this plant, which is developed by, uh, for now I understand how to pronounce it, I can't say it, <laughs> and freestone, um, it is uh, tracing the raw material, so the geological material, so the sand in this case, uh, for the silica and the heavy minerals in the sand for uh, the alumina and the titanium, and it separates glass coming from Egypt, so the one above the lines are from Egypt, and there are some uh, Roman glasses, so this is all major glass from the first millennium, the different types. Uh, the antimony glasses, even though they don't have as much titanium, they're still believed to come from Egypt. But as you can see, the blue workshop, which are behind the circles here, are all plotting as Roman manganese type glasses. So no Byzantine glasses, uh, in that context, and then the later colored ones, they also plot as Roman manganese glasses, although some of them, so the yellow, uh, maybe raw materials that I showed you, they seem to start there and move the way out here towards higher alumina silica, uh, the same with some of these amber colored beads. I'll get back to that, why that is, maybe. Um, for the vessel, get, so to go back to the first workshop where you only had the blue glass and then you had shirts of uh, vessel glass, if you look at the vessel glass, they were making these Roman type glasses, but they actually have very high cover and lead. Baffling to me that they have more cover and lead than the cover glasses. Uh, so this is the covering, but they're still transparent. And here's a study from Hamwich. Yeah. <laughs> Um, where uh, Freestone and Raren had looked at glasses, um, and in the Roman time, London, they have the transparent glasses had very low colorants, so lead and copper. But uh, in the recycled uh, context of Cambridge, so in early Middle Ages, they have recycled these Roman glasses so many times that any colored glasses that were mixed in with these transparent glasses have contaminated them, and so they're very high. And these vessel glasses seem to be part of these very recycled uh, Roman glasses. And uh, we also see, if we just 
That's one. That it's not just the case for copper and lead in these resin places. We also see for manganese. So again, there's been uh, Roman resins that have contaminated or re worked into these uh, resins that have been remelted over and over in the Middle East context. Um, our question was, of course, when we find a workshop with transparent resin glass and tessera, and then a lot of what could be um, scrapped from um, production, and then we find these splits, is it that we have the raw material, so the vessel glass and the tessera, that they melted together and used to produce beads? And basically, since they're all manganese raw materials, there are very few uh, places or very few parts where you can make mixing lines. But one of them is using the colorant and then the antimony, which is very, very high in the tessera. In fact, here plus the tessera, but they are actually much, much higher. So if you melt them, they have the crystals of the um, antimony in them. So that means that they really cut much higher on the swap. And if you mix that with these vessel, transparent vessel glasses, then you have the tessera up here and the vessel glass here. And yes, in fact, you have all the others, the beads, the splints, the things that have uh, remnants of the tools. So this that needs to be scrapped from working and making the beads floating in between. So go one more. Looks like we have a mix of a range here of these vessel glasses and chestnut which flush out of the screen here uh, to produce the beads. In the later workshop, uh, we have the different kinds of colors and we have cover for doing the blue and the green, and we have iron, and then we have yellow, but it's yellow tin, it's not uh, lead tin, it's not lead antimony like the Romans did, so this seems to be old Roman glass, but it seems like they have colored the yellow using a newer technique, and I'm very cautious here because that technique actually existed about 200 BC, kind of disappeared, and came back around 400 AD, and really um, became something they used a lot. So they seem to have old Roman glass, but maybe they actually worked these and colored them by mixing the color and then melting the glass and then mixing the two together. And when they do that, mixing the color and over in a little clay crucible, that clay crucible could have been contaminated and that may be why we have the yellows flooding out here. So it is not Byzantine glass, it is in fact a contamination from these clay crucible that they work. And of course, we don't know if they made the yellow in Egypt or if they imported it and it was made somewhere else. So just to sum up for the early workshop, it looks like we have uh, the raw materials and the blue beads being actually could be made there since they have the raw materials. Could also be made somewhere else, but then they're importing both what could be the raw materials and the product, which are the beads. Uh, the vessel class shows these typical signs of uh, recycling. So it almost appears to us that they imported them maybe as shirts, as broken glass, because they needed them. One thing I forgot to find out is it takes very little. You can see on the plot that I showed the mixing line, there's a lot of vessel glass, and then maybe a mix of a little bit of tesla to make it blue beads, because all the beads are very close to the vessel glass in cover and and then I'm going to let him talk about the rain. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let's see, I just wanted to uh, round up the presentation by coming back to our question. So what we were interested in uh, from the beginning was what the glass had to say about long distance trade. And actually, as, as in, what we expected was that especially those clear blue splinters, they looked so much like uh, what was being out execution glass. So we, we had imagined that the glass would actually point us to clear areas of Mediterranean contacts quite early on. And as you saw from Richard's presentation, that would not have been unlikely because there was a lot of uh, glass uh, in the context of the late antique uh, building works. So why on earth could this very movable material not have been taken north in small quantities, rather small quantities needed for doing glass beads as compared to uh, furnishing a church. Yet, 
What we found to our surprise, not only in the very early workshop, but also in the later workshop, was that without exception, all the materials that we get are the uh, Imperial Roman types, which means that no, none of the new class types seem to be coming to Riga in the 8th century, or at least in most of the 8th century. And I think the best explanation that we can find for that is that the recirculation that is being taken place does not involve the Mediterranean sites, which would have had a component of Byzantine or Islamic class, but is more likely to show materials that were already in Northern Europe and probably in the, uh, in the uh, Frankish lands. The weakness of that, and perhaps that's something that some of the audience has filled in, is that we haven't identified so far uh, the sites where we have the same uh, mixture of materials. But uh, I think the laser presenters will also be able to fill us in on that. So in the late workshop that we didn't talk uh, much about, about, except for that single uh, plot, you do get both the Carolingian Group Wood Axe Glass and the uh, Islamic Plant Axe Glass. No, I forgot, I forgot to mention that. And the Plant Axe Glass, to the best of our knowledge, because it's actually really hard to distinguish between Sasanian and Islamic plant air flash. But if we look at the potassium magnesium, it looks like the blue beads, the plant air flash, actually is Sasanian coming from Iran. Um, the same as a very recent study by Phelps, where they're using the calcium aluminum versus uh, aluminum versus calcium. Um, is it calcium? Magnesium. And there they also plug in the Sasanian band. So it looks like the plant band, but maybe there's some that can tell me more about how the distinguish between the two. It looks like the plant ash band is from the east. Which will be very exciting, but the glass tube types certainly are the ones that we, we associate with the acid uh, uh, imports in general. But uh, Iran could be a very lucky. Anyway, so let's, well, certainly Middle Eastern class would be uh, types and very new types in the 9th century. Before. So very short interruption. So I think this might be a point to uh, Irene's notion of a Northern Europe in the uh, 8th century being a more local affair than we had uh, expected from the uh, wide range of uh, glass uh, available in central time. Yeah. And um, oh, that's it. That's it. Did you? Yeah, that's it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, was there a that's me.